Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mack, for that, that great introduction. Uh, thank you, President McBride, for, for pulling us all together today for what I think is a really important conversation. And thanks again for giving me the great opportunity to address uh, the faculty and, and students and supporters of the new school. So really, uh, really appreciate it. Um, you know, the, the national security concerns for the new administration, the national security status for our country in a post-Trump world um, is incredibly compelling. Um, it, you know, calls to mind immediately the, the old adage, you know, you, you'll, you're condemned to live in interesting times. And we certainly live in very interesting times. Um, so it's, I'm happy to be able to talk about these things today. There are very many, many more than we'll be able to address. And I'm going to try to keep my uh, remarks uh, short so we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, but there are just a few things that I'd like to touch on uh, before, before we move forward with uh, with our questions part of the conversation. Um, back in 2006, when I first started working terrorism issues for the FBI, I had the opportunity to meet with uh, very close colleagues from the UK. Of course, we have, enjoy a great relationship with our intelligence and law enforcement colleagues uh, in London and across the UK. And so I remember sitting with a few of them and talking about the difference in approach that we had in the United States to terrorism threats. And I was explaining that in the post 9-11 world, um, the American government and the American people really had a zero tolerance for risk. And that translated to us um, in, a, in a very visceral way. Every, every counterterrorism lead that we got, we had to follow up on and, and fully investigate. And, uh, my British friends said that they were living in a very different world, that they were a much smaller service and they had many, many more threats than we did. And so they, so they took the theory of whacking the alligator closest to the canoe, uh, which was kind of a, a humorous but really um, important way to describe, like you have to take care of the threats that are closest to you, that are the most likely to hurt you first. You have to focus on those first. So in keeping with that philosophy, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, um, the rise of domestic violent extremism here in the United States. Uh, it's no secret that the FBI considers this uh, the most significant terrorist threat that we face today. Uh, Director Ray, FBI Director Ray testified to that effect uh, last summer. And since that testimony, we've seen um, just an incredibly disturbing uh, rise in violence, culminating, of course, with the events on January 6th, when a riotous mob of, of insurrectionists united under the banner of uh, former President Trump attacked our national capital in an effort to stop the certification uh, of, the, of the vote for uh, uh, presidency. Um, so let's talk a little bit about domestic violent extremists. It's not a new threat, right? We've had domestic violent extremist groups and individuals in this country for many, many years. Um, the FBI looks across that spectrum of domestic violent extremist groups and puts them all into four different categories. Those groups that are racially motivated, they, we have groups that are motivated by an anti-government uh, perspective. We have groups that are motivated by anti-abortion activities. And the last group are those, uh, the last grouping are those that are motivated by, um, that are inclined to uh, participate in what we refer to as environmental terrorism. The first, the biggest, the most concerning, the most dangerous is of course that first group of racially motivated uh, extremists. These are the folks that you expect to hear about. These are the, the groups that we've known about for a long time, the KKK, the Aryan Nation, other white power groups. They also include an array of right-wing extremist groups that have really risen in the last few years, groups that are dedicated to anti-immigration stances or anti-feminism stances, um, groups like the Proud Boys or the Three Percenters. Um, so that uh, what we consider to be racially motivated uh, category has really grown uh, in the last four years. The other, the other group of the four that's of particular concern to us right now are the anti-government groups, uh, sovereign citizens, people who refuse to pay taxes and you know, won't put 
license plates on their cars because they reject the influence of uh, government and their personal lives, all the way up to groups like the Oath Keepers, the kind of self-described security forces that deploy themselves to political protest activity in an effort to protect what they believe is the, is, is the status quo. Um, these are the groups that we saw really active on January 6th. Um, what's different about this threat now? Well, the first thing that I would point to is that unity of purpose. So formerly on the domestic violent extremist side, we, th we, we thought about all these different groups as being kind of niche focused, um, you know, individually motivated by their own specific ideologies, able to communicate and recruit from like-minded associates in their local communities, but pretty much focused locally on their individual uh, perspectives. The difference today is that all of these groups are, seem to be united under the common cause of supporting our former president and supporting the conservative political causes that they believe in uh, very strongly anti-immigration uh, issues, uh, Second Amendment issues, um, and, and generally anti-government uh, sentiment. Um, what you saw on January 6th was that unity of purpose that brought together a formerly disorganized, non-hierarchical uh, spectrum of extremists all together around one singular purpose, and that being obstructing the certification of the election of uh, Joseph Biden as president and the reinstallation of their preferred candidate, Donald Trump. We've known for a long time in law enforcement and intelligence that groups and individuals are far more potent and far more dangerous when organized and acting together. And I think that's exactly what you saw on January 1st. The other thing that's different, major difference in this threat today than it's been you know, in 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, has been the outstanding influence of social media on the ability for groups to communicate, to organize, uh, to plan operational activity. Um, this is the same sort of evolution that we saw on the international terrorist side over the last 10 years. So as groups like Al Qaeda and ISIS really gravitated towards social media as a means of recruiting um, and planning uh, operations, you're seeing the same thing on the domestic violent extremist side today, which is really concerning. And, and of course, the ability to conduct those communications in an entirely encrypted uh, and private way that's beyond the reach of law enforcement uh, or intelligence. The final thing that I think makes the threat very different today is the prevalence of weapons. Domestic violent extremists, uh, by their own name, right, have always been prone towards violent criminal activity, um, but the sheer volume and significance of the readily available military style weapons, battlefield ready weapons is really concerning. So where you may have had a protest at a local state house 10 years ago where you know, your local Klan group or uh, right-wing group would get stand, you know, get, gather to protest as any other group can. Today, you see that activity taking place among people who are carrying uh, assault rifles with multiple magazines. So what might have been 10 years ago, a political protest that could have the capability of devolving into some sort of conflict, now you have the possibility that that conflict could lead potentially to a mass violence or mass shooting event. So that greatly ratchets up the pressure on uh, law enforcement to keep those things um, under control. There are similarities in the domestic violent extremist side that we see to the uh, um, international terrorist extremist side. Um, and that is, uh, the, it is a very similar path towards radicalization and extremism. What you're seeing among the right-wing groups now is, as I mentioned earlier, a greater degree of organization um, inspired by a charismatic leader um, focused intently on perceived grievances that society has inflicted upon them. And this decision that the only course forward is to pursue a path of violence uh, and revolution. You know, all of those themes overlay very, um, uh, very accurately 
onto the emergence of Al Qaeda or the same sort of theories and philosophies that are espoused by groups like ISIS as they try to appeal to additional recruits to come uh, into the fold and to join their cause. So I guess the question for us today and more importantly for the new administration is what do we do about this threat that's really developed and become um, much more serious in the last few years? I think the first thing the administration should consider doing is enacting new legislation. Um, if you think about addressing this threat with the same sort of focus and commitment that we did with the international terrorism threat after 9-11, um, you'll remember that after 9-11, one of the first and most significant things we did was enacted the Patriot Act to give law enforcement and intelligence additional tools to address to address the threat. I think the same thing needs to happen here on the domestic violent extremist side. Um, there currently is no crime of domestic terrorism in the United States. Domestic terrorism is defined in statute, but there's no criminal penalties associated with it. I think that's the first place they need to think about changing the law to finally acknowledge and penalize domestic terrorist activity. Um, there's also a, there are challenges in the United States to investigating and collecting intelligence on domestic extremists, simply because by definition, they are Americans, they're here in the country, they're protected by the, by the First Amendment. Um, and, and what they're engaging in at its simplest level is political speech. Um, so it's not the same as investigating international terrorists or international terrorist groups where mere membership in those organizations is a federal crime. Here, uh, law enforcement and intelligence is essentially has to wait until violent crimes are underway or at least in the planning stages before being able to initiate investigations and move forward. And that um, puts our law enforcement folks in a, in a very tough spot. So new DT le um, legislation, um, uh, kind of a new approach to um, how we think about investigating those groups. And finally, uh, it's absolutely necessary in my eyes for us, for the government to uh, impanel a commission along the same lines as the 9-11 commission uh, to really peel back all the facts and the implications of that horrible attack on January 6th. There are many, many decisions that were made that, that um, I think uh, it's, it's certainly viable to go back and, and relook at the intelligence that our law enforcement folks had leading into the event, how they thought about that intelligence, the sort of decisions and assumptions they made based on what they were hearing, um, and then, of course, um, how they prepared for and protected the Capitol uh, during the attack. So there's a lot of work uh, there that needs to be done by a serious and professional non-political uh, commission. So that's on, I think, the most compelling issue on the domestic side. On the foreign side, I'll just touch um, briefly on um, what I think is the next alligator closest to the canoe. And that is, of course, the increasingly hostile actions that we are uh, seeing and bearing the brunt of from the government of Russia. Um, I think the best example of that, of course, recently is the hack, uh, what's been referred to as the solar winds hack. So if you haven't been following that, there's a, uh, an IT uh, company here in the United States named SolarWinds. They um, design and sell uh, networking software that's really an essential piece of many, many businesses and government agencies. It's a way that um, entities, uh, it's a software that they rely on to create their internal networks to have to be able to communicate um, internally. Um, it, it appears uh, that the Russian government, elements of Russian intelligence, hacked into that company, buried a sort of Trojan horse uh, capability into the update of the SolarWinds software, which the SolarWinds Corporation, un, not knowing it was there, pushed inadvertently pushed that update out to all 18,000 of their clients. Um, I think we've heard in recent media reporting that as many as nine government agencies here in the United States have been affected by the hack and untold thousands of numbers of, uh, of private sector entities. I think the level of uh, complexity and kind of the long range planning that had to have gone into a cyber attack of this uh, scope is uh, uh, unbelievably concerning. 
It is the type of attack that cyber professionals refer to as a supply chain attack. So rather than having to go through the effort or the, or the risk of trying to hack into all these different companies and government agencies, they very adeptly identified one company that served them all and uh, effectively inserted themselves into that system and, and were delivered uh, essentially to the victims that they initially sought. Um, this is a, uh, an extension of what's been years of Russian aggressive activity in cyberspace. Um, of course, most notably their efforts to uh, impact and influence our federal presidential election in 2016, um, which has been now proven and acknowledged by multiple investigations and multiple different uh, entities. Um, so there is no stopping the government of Russia and their intent to undermine um, our systems. And I think that's an important perspective from which to evaluate this activity. We have to remind ourselves that from the Russian government perspective, um, our disunion, our discord, chaos, splitting us from our uh, partners, our foreign partners, um, negatively impacting the cohesion and the unity of things like the European Union, those are all perennial goals, strategic goals of the government of Russia. They are most concerned about a unified um, America, a, a, an America, a NATO alliance that is strong and, um, and consistent in their approach to Russia. What they pursue is a disorganized collection of rivals and adversaries that are easier for them to, uh, to target and to, and to evade. So these cyber activities that we're seeing from the Russians in the last few years are entirely consistent with one of the fundamental theories of the way they um, align themselves against Western powers. Um, so once again, the Biden administration, what do you do about this? Well, from recent reporting from individuals like uh, Jake Sullivan, who is the new national security advisor to President Biden, we're getting some strong signals that decisions have already been made. Um, the national, national security advisor indicated on, um, on news shows last Sunday that the decisions have been made about uh, proactive responses on the part of uh, the American government directed towards Russia, uh, responses that would be both, quote, seen and unseen, uh, responses that would go considerably beyond sanctions. Um, so it sounds like we have uh, some significant action towards the government of Russia teed up um, that we should probably be seeing in the next few days, if not weeks. Uh, a huge turnaround from the way Russian aggression was uh, ignored or um, you know, tolerated under the Trump administration, which took a inexplicably um, positive uh, approach, made every effort it seems to avoid uh, confronting Russia on many of these same topics. So uh, I think that's um, I think it's a positive sign that we've that we're moving in a different direction going forward. Those are probably the two things that are capturing my attention most lately on the national security side. Uh, before I hand it back to uh, Professor Pisano, I would just touch on a few other major decisions that the administration is going to be looking at in the next few uh, weeks or months. Happy to go into any of these in greater detail as our conversation goes on. Um, first, uh, in the Middle East, uh, we're coming up on really a momentous occasion um, in Afghanistan, where uh, several months ago, the Trump administration negotiated with the Taliban an agreement that included the complete removal of US forces by May 1st of this year. So that deadline is coming up quickly, which means that President Biden is gonna to have to decide whether to follow through on that agreement, pull US forces out and likely watch the country collapse into the exact same sort of uh, civil war that, that, that started after the, the Russians left uh, Afghanistan many, many decades ago. Um, or whether he decides to keep troops in Afghanistan uh, to try to assist the, uh, the government and the Taliban to come to some sort of a resolution to their dispute, which hasn't even, negotiations haven't even begun on that one uh, between those two sides yet. So that's gonna be a really interesting one to watch. Um, of course, you have North Korea continues to pursue 
uh, the development of nuclear weapons, contrary to the um, uh, efforts of the Trump administration to negotiate an, uh, an end to uh, nuclear uh, North Korea. Um, we have, we've got a, the Biden administration is talking about a return to the JCPOA, the agreement, uh, the former agreement with Iran that had Iran agreeing not to um, essentially continue enriching uranium to uh, pursue a nuclear weapons capacity. Uh, the Trump administration unilaterally pulled out of that agreement. And we've heard recently from the Biden administration that they seek to kind of get back to the table with Iran. And that's uh, important work that I hope they're able to move forward. And finally, uh, in Asia, we have a, a really what can best be described as an incredibly, um, I think, ragged relationship with the government of China. Um, President Trump's approach seemed to be at first to, on a personal level, try to develop some sort of a personal relationship with President Xi um, to try to use that to his advantage. That doesn't seem to have happened. Um, the relationship then devolved into um, you know, economic, essentially a trade war with dueling economic sanctions, and then finally bottomed out uh, a year ago as, the, as President Trump uh, pretty forcefully blamed the government of China for the coronavirus pandemic. So um, how we get back to some sort of a functioning uh, interaction with the government of China uh, as a result of, of that, that uh, nadir is, is really going to be a, a challenge to the new administration. So as always, these national security topics are incredibly uh, fascinating to watch. We have a lot of balls in the air as a country right now, and each one of them are uh, incredibly important, impactful issues, and it's going to be uh, incredibly interesting to see how the new administration finds their way through this, this dangerous uh, series of, of choices that they'll have to approach in the first year um, of their work. So with that, I'll hand it back to Professor Pisano and um, there you are. Thank you so much, uh, Director McCabe, uh, for, for your comments and for your participation in this forum. We're really looking forward to, uh, to a fruitful dialogue. Thank you also to Professor Mack and to uh, President McBride for, um, for permitting this to happen. So I would like to start off with an issue that um, Director McCabe, you and I have discussed before, and I know is very much on the minds and hearts of um, many of those who are listening. Um, and that has to do with um, the problem we have in this country uh, with structural racism and policing, including the presence of white supremacists within the policing apparatus and military. Um, for those who previously may have been unaware uh, of that fact, the Capitol attack, uh, attack obviously made that quite plain. Now, we know, and we shouldn't need to say, uh, that Americans with different skin tones have vastly divergent experiences of and with law enforcement, but we do have to say it because Daniel Prude, Patrick Warren, Xavier Hill, Elijah McCain, Ahmaud Arbery, we could go on for days. Um, this is unacceptable in a democracy. So my question for you is the following. Given the FBI's historical role, both as a law enforcement agency providing for American security, often without public acknowledgement or due credit, and in cases that remain very painful for Mary, many Americans as an active agent of white supremacism. What path forward toward change, including change in specific policies and procedures, do you see within the FBI, DHS, and other law enforcement agencies? Yeah, thank you, um, Professor. It's a, a obviously, Incredibly important question, and there's a lot packed into uh, packed into this topic. Um, so first, I, I totally agree with you. Like it, it is, we shouldn't have to say that uh, people of color have a different experience with law enforcement and with every aspect of life in this country. Um, but but at the same time, it's it's unbelievably important that we do say it, um, and not just in venues like this, but. Uh, in any place where we're talking about, you know, the path forward in terms of uh, policy and law and, and how we're going to someday rise up to the, you know, to reach the potential that, uh, that we, on, we all want this country to have. Um, from the FBI side, I mean, look, the FBI has a, 
long and very checkered history on racial issues um, from the surveillance of, of political opponents in the beginning in the, you know, in the 1920s and 30s and all the way up into the 60s of surveillance of civil rights activists. Um, and how did we pull out of some of the worst aspects of that history um, only with the participation of um, really legit, you know, strong leadership, number one, and number two, um, pervasive oversight. So it was no surprise. It was the church commissions and the original issuance of the attorney general guidelines in the 19, early 1970s that opened up the FBI, that exposed the um, activities that we had been involved in and um, brought us to a new level of transparency in how we deal with those things. Is it a perfect institution to this day? It is absolutely not a perfect institution today, but it is much better than the FBI that America uh, had in up until the 1960s and 70s. And that, that process never ends. We are fundamentally a racist country. We, are, we were founded upon the, you know, upon the efforts of an enslaved people. Um, and all of our government institutions are affected by that history, by what lingers as a result of that history. Um, in all of us, and not just in all of us, but, but in, in, especially in those of us who still to this day espouse racist beliefs. The FBI is no different um, in that respect. Uh, I think the only way to address that is to be incredibly um, forward-leaning in uh, constantly reiterating that diversity is a core value of the institution, which it is, which uh, the, the core value that Director Comey added um, uh, to the FBI. Um, so it's gotta be pursued in all aspects of recruiting and hiring and promotions internally, but also it has to be a constant commitment in the work that, that the FBI does. Um, that work suffered a, uh, I think, a pretty significant um, step backwards under the Trump administration where the Department of Justice under Attorney General Sessions and later under Attorney General Barr um, very visibly um, deprioritized the work of the Civil Rights Division, stopped engaging in, you know, basically opposed engaging with local police departments on consent decrees and other sorts of investigations that would ultimately lead to the um, improvements in policing tactics and the exposure of um, racist practices in, in police departments. I mean, that's how we address that at the federal level through consent decrees and other investigations. And, um, you know, Attorney General Sessions made it, made it clear he wasn't interested in doing any of that work. Um, they made a decision as an administration to position themselves as champions of law enforcement rather than as the um, custodians of law enforcement, which they, which they should have been. So I have no doubt that the Biden administration sees these issues very differently. Um, I think that the, that the selections of, you know, Lisa Monaco as deputy attorney general and the selection for the, uh, as the head of the uh, Civil Rights Division. They, um, the comments by Merrick Garland, who is, you know, hasn't been confirmed yet, but likely will be confirmed as the next Attorney General. These are all people who are deeply committed to social justice and to reforming um, law enforcement and policing in this country. It's not gonna happen overnight. Uh, they're not gonna be able to fix everything, but it starts with leadership and it starts with a commitment uh, to enforcing those values, really pursuing the sort of justice that this country should have and, and, and has never had. Thank you for that. So I wonder if we could push a little further on that theme mm -hmm. and to think about um, not just sort of top down, but also bottom up. Um, before you served in your um, most recent positions, you saw also had extensive experience as a field agent um, and exposure to uh, the training that goes along with that. I would imagine that um, agents are really, and those who, who are custodians of them, right, are really up against um, a very difficult problem, which is to say that in a racist country, as you acknowledge, um, people learn from a young age and are exposed to ideas um, about uh, the relationship um, between lawlessness uh, and law abidingness um, that uh, we're told map onto skin tone. Uh, 
in, in, in the sort of racist discourses that dominate. So my question is at the level of um, training, uh, recruitment, sort of the practice, how, how, does one, um, how does one get past this problem within an institution in your view? Yeah, I, I um, well, I think you have to go far beyond um, what we've been doing for decades, right? I think back on my own training and kind of indoctr indoctrination into, into the FBI. And while it was um, made perfectly clear to all of us that we were there to uphold the constitution. That was our first, that's, we swear an oath to the constitution. And our mission is to protect America. And, um, and we do that by following the law first, foremost, last, that's what we do. And all law, you know, um, uh, kind of originates with the constitution. And that, and, and that, that should be enough that people should be able to conclude that you do that fairly, you do it equitably, you do it with compassion and understanding. Um, but unfortunately, it's not. And I think we've learned that over time. And so um, the FBI that I left was much more invested in drawing attention to the issues of uh, injustice, uh, racial injustice in the, in the criminal justice system and, and in the country writ large than the FBI that I entered in 1996. Um, all FBI agents and new analysts um, undergo uh, as a part of their training at Quantico. They spend an entire day um, at the Holocaust um, Museum in DC and also um, at the Martin Luther King um, monument, they get an entire day's worth of training on kind of opening their eyes to this reality and the fact that we are, we need to be a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. And, you know, we've been both um, and more one than the other, probably historically. Um, so that's the first step. Um, the next step is, you know, law enforcement needs to vigorously police its own. I mean, um, these views are absolutely inconsistent with the mission of protecting your community, whatever color that community is, wherever it's located, however much money it has or doesn't have, whoever it supports in local political races. We are supposed to be apolitical and we are there for the benefit of all. Um, and when we see that um, you know, 10% of the people arrested at for having been involved, there's about 230, maybe 250 people that have been arrested so far. Just about 10% of them have law enforcement or military experience. Of the people who've been arrested, as of last weekend, it was about 30 who were arrested and to be and known to be members of domestic violent extremist groups. 30% of those were former military or law enforcement. I mean, these are numbers that are, should shock and uh, really bother leadership, uh, the leadership in both law enforcement and military communities. It's absolutely inconsistent with service to country, service to community, fair service to all. And that, that has got to be eliminated. I know that General Austin is taking some very proactive steps to kind of raise this within uh, the Department of Defense. Um, and we need to do the same in the law enforcement community. It's a much more disparate community. There are something like 18,000 different or 17,000 different uh, law enforcement organizations in the United States that cover over 800,000 sworn officers. Um, and they have, you know, look, this is America. They, those people have very different views about these things. What we have to do from a national level, not just the FBI, but you know, the, the major law enforcement associations, major city chiefs, major county sheriffs and those groups need to raise this as, an, as, a, as a critical, as an imperative issue to address from the top to the bottom. Um, are we ever gonna completely eradicate it? It's, it's, no, we won't, but we could do a lot better than we're doing right now. Thank you. So we've been thinking about sort of how the challenges right that exist between um, many communities in our country and law enforcement um but law enforcement has also been on under attack uh from sort of another part of the political spectrum um under the previous administration um i wonder if you could speak to how you understand those challenges for the fbi and for other law enforcement agencies um in the wake 
of uh, of sort of relentless attacks, right, on um, on uh, on these institutions as um, as as protectors of of the American people and um, and of the country, um, and how also politically you sort of see this challenge given the simultaneous um, nadir of trust in law enforcement on, on the part of some members of the community uh, because of the issues we've just discussed and skepticism at yeah. the other end of the political spectrum. Yeah, it, it's, it's hard. I mean, it's been a hard couple of years for everyone. So I don't want to over dramatize just for uh, law enforcement community, but it's been a very tough, strange period for, for that community. When you have at one end of the spectrum, you have, you know, we had a president who was basically on a unrelenting tirade against um, many different aspects of the federal government, but particularly the Department of Justice and the FBI. Um, that's, you know, and the conservatives who supported him and also participated in those attacks, particularly the conservatives on, on Capitol Hill, um, you know, that's that that's the crowd that law enforcement expects to go to for support. So I think on one level, it was just um, kind of the whiplash of realizing that the, the, the people that you thought were always on your side are all of a sudden become some of your most vocal critics. At the same time, there was a lot of criticism coming from you know, folks who were uh, representatives of minority communities and people who just had it with what seemed like an, a, a, a rash of uh, horrific incidents of, of police misconduct and uh, abuse of, of prisoners and, and people they'd arrested and resulting in like the, the horrible, um, you know, examples that you laid out just a little while ago. So it's been, um, you know, it's been, it's been a really tough period. I would say that the, the shelter for law enforcement and particularly law enforcement leadership in times like these is to just stay in the middle, to try to acknowledge political wins for what they are, and to stay, um, to try to stay true to those core beliefs of following the law and doing your job. Um, you know, we are not a society that's ready to eliminate law enforcement. This is, this, it's an absolutely imperative piece of the fabric that holds this country together. There's a role for legitimate law-abiding, um, you know, the enforcement of, uh, of the criminal code across all peoples and all, all states and all communities in the same way. So um, we still need law enforcement today in the same way that we always have. Um, but there are some embedded issues around policing that have to be addressed. And it's very tough to do that when the leadership and the law enforcement representatives feel like they're under attack from both sides. I think you're, it's almost a perfect storm of inaction, right? It's like um, at a time when you need people to kind of put their biases and prejudices and like hurt feelings and grievances aside and come to the table and have a productive conversation around policing and where, you know, where do we go from here? you have, you know, your backs are up higher than they ever have been. Um, but further retreating into those polls, you know, around kind of blue lives matter and all this, all this other stuff is, is not making our chances for real change any better. All right. Well, we will, we can leave off that subject there, although there's a great deal more to discuss and um, perhaps we'll return to it in the audience Q and A. Um, I'd like to turn from uh, um, enforcement to uh, criminal justice um, and in the context of the Capitol, uh, the attack on the Capitol, and how you're thinking about a very particular and strange problem that we have right now, um, which is namely uh, that the US government and the American people are facing an ongoing, um, arguably, security threat from a former president uh, and from the elected officials who claim, who claim not to recognize the legitimacy of the current administration. So um, on the one hand, this seems like uh, um, some people have interpreted this as you know, democracy being fragile and this being uh, a great problem with polarization and so forth. On the other hand, one could look at this slightly differently and understand that um, the problem may be slightly different. Uh, people who attacked the Capitol by their own, in their own description, um, were defending democracy and the Constitution, right? They uh, believe 
uh, the former president rather than all of the public officials who conduct our elections. And so there's a question about authority here, um, maybe even more than uh, democratic values for some. So if those who um, oppose uh, and do not accept the legitimacy of the current administration themselves um, believe that their intent is to protect democracy, um, how, how do you think about that? And how ought, ought law enforcement and the criminal justice system treat that question? I, mean, I, I guess my answer is I try not to think about it because it's so terrifying that it, I, I, it's hard to sleep at night. It's the, um, I guess maybe the right word is absurdity of seeing the Capitol attacked by a mob of flag waving people who claim they're defending the constitution. It's just like, you, you can't hold both of those ideas in your head at the same time. Um, but, it, but it does, it draws a fine point on, on that kind of dilemma that, you, that, you point, that you've uh, described for us. Um, I guess, I mean, let's put aside for a moment the, the, the information, because I don't want to call it fact, that most of those people are acting on, we know to be false. It's provably false. I, I don't care who you voted for or who you wanted to win, but the facts aren't changed by politics. The efficacy and legitimacy of the election has, has not, there's not a single valid um, significant allegation to the election that's been proven by any fact whatsoever. So they're all motivated by this collection of falsehoods. Now, the, it's many of them, I guess, believe them deeply and they feel like they're doing something um, to express their political views. But, um, you know, they're conveniently overlooking the fact that in a democracy, we have a political process. We, we protect, uh, vigorously protect everyone's right to uh, express those views, but you can't express them with violence. So the rationalization that, like, well, we had to attack the Capitol, uh, which included an attempt to maybe kidnap and kill the Speaker of the House and the Vice President, was because it was necessary to protect the Constitution. It's just, it just doesn't hold water. Um, I have no doubt that many of them were really caught up in the moment, and um, which is one of the reasons why the the long term damage from January sixth is going to be the unbelievable influence that it will have on extremists ability to recruit additional members. This is, I'm sure, seen by most as an, as an incredible victory, a day of liberation and the, you know, kind of um, living out their, their greatest dreams on some level, which is really, really dangerous and going to create problems for us on the radicalization side in the future. Um, but none of that, you know, it's like they say, you know, every first year law student can tell you ignorance of the law is no defense. The fact that they were um, mistakenly, emotionally, politically, what have you, motivated by what they thought was a legitimate constitutional issue, it doesn't, um, it doesn't justify what happened there. Okay. Thanks. So let's take, um, let's take this uh, theme and as a segue to international politics. Mm -hmm. um, in the US, we tend to think about right-wing armed movements as a homegrown phenomenon. Um, but uh, those uh, who observe politics internationally, um, you know, may have noticed some similarities between the events at the Capitol and uh, certain other similar phenomena uh, elsewhere in the world. Um, we also know that the events at the Capitol were watched very closely from abroad. Um, before the attack on the Capitol, certain voices in the Kremlin media constellation had been foreshadowing the disorder for weeks, arguing that the American ele election had been marred by irregularities and instructing Russian viewers, quote, to watch closely and buy popcorn. Um, now, in that part of the world, we have seen similar um, events in Ukraine in 2014. There were organized groups of armed extremists uh, aligned with an embattled president in a moment of constitutional crisis, stormed Capitol buildings and attacked police officers while announcing their intentions to abduct politicians, conduct show trials and start a civil war. 
They um, used similar symbols like Confederate and Confederate adjacent flags. Um, they even wore surgical masks, although there were more of those in Ukraine in 2014 than in Washington in 2021. Um, and there were even some common players uh, we're aware of, um, like uh, Roger Stone and Paul Manafort, um, Roger Stone being the originator of Stop the Steal in 2016. So, all of these um, formal similarities, whether they mean anything about the origins of the movements or not, kind of um, cause us to ask some questions. And so I wondered if you could talk with us a little bit about transnational aspects of extremist movements. How much communication is going on um, between some of the organizations that participated in the attack on the Capitol and some of their um, ideological uh, brethren um, in Europe and in elsewhere? It's a great question, um, Jessica. I think it helps um, to think about those connections across a broad range of, um, of possibilities. So at one end of the spectrum, you have um, you know, horrific acts of violence uh, perpetrated by individuals who are acting on their own um, you know, their own ideology, whether it's right-wing or anti-immigrant or whatever it might be. In those instances, we have already seen actors in the United States, uh, the El Paso shooter from last year, year before, um, the Tree of Life uh, um, attack, are taking cues. They're watching the same sort of events happen in other places. Of course, they don't happen nearly as frequently in other places as they do here, but um, they are pointing to like-minded extremists in other countries and the, their, their attacks and their reasonings and their manifestos. So we know that there is that international connection, at least among uh, highly violent, destructive individuals who ultimately uh, act out in, in crimes of violence. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, you have just political movements, right? And we've seen over the last five or six years an alarming rise of these quote unquote populist political movements across the globe. Um, you know, we've seen it in South America. We've certainly seen it across Europe and where these, these populist candidates um, are, are, you know, rising um, in terms of their representation of, you know, within, um, within national legislatures or in uh, president or prime minister roles. Um, and, most of them draw some comparison between themselves to former President Trump. So even just on a political mass level, we see kind of very similar kind of reflections in the tone of political speech, in the use of grievance to challenge uh, what is seen as, you know, uh, globalist, corrupt government, you know, government institutions, knocking down institutions. Um, so I, I think that there is a, this is not just a US thing. There are clear reverberations across that spectrum. Um, whether or not the groups that we're seeing right now, like the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters and others are actually coordinating with or talking to, communicating with extremist groups overseas. I don't know the answer to that. I wouldn't be surprised by it at all. Uh, what last week we saw the Canadians basically designated the Proud Boys as a, as a uh, terrorist organization. So clearly they have a presence in Canada. Um, so I think we, like I said, I, I don't wanna, I don't wanna be too conclusive here. I wouldn't be surprised if there's that kind of, there's that kind of, uh, kind of uh, exchange of information and the building of relationships across those groups as well. Okay, thank you. So thinking further um, transnationally and internationally, um, and coming back to your comments about uh, Russia and the threat that it um, that the Russian state uh, expresses toward the United States, um, and also with the sort of just noting um, for those who may not follow sort of Russian news that the the discourse um, about the United States for many years in Russian um, state media is is one of a state at war, right? Um, the notion of uh, that we were going to have a warm relationship with Russia is certainly um, not reflective of the of the way Russian elites uh, have talked about the United States since far uh, long before the um, previous administration. So um, the Russian state's recent interventions in American politics really strongly resemble a pattern we've seen uh, 
by Russia with respect to the European Union, where the Russian state has sown division um, by also supporting European far right polit uh, parties. And there's no indication that this strategy of division is going to change. Um, but the availability of certain tactics certainly may change, uh, especially now that the former president is no longer available to Russian state actors as chief, chief executive, um, even as he may for a time remain a significant figure working outside of traditional political institutions and perhaps with the same kind of orientation toward Russia, um, which appears to be um, different than the current administration. So um, my question, uh, I guess, asks you to talk a little bit more about solar winds or other similar um, approaches in, in this changing institutional context in the United States, what are your expectations about how the nature of Russian state tactics might change? I, I think we've, um, I think you'll, this is not a, a surprising prediction at all. I think every, everyone on the webinar here today would probably agree, but you'll see the continued rise of uh, Russians use of malign cyber activity. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, first, it's it's incredibly, all of the risks associated with intelligence collection by uh, agents that you would send to a, foreign, to a foreign nation to work against that nation to collect their secrets or to collect out intelligence, all of the risks that that work uh, presents to a country are avoided by cyber activities. You don't have to send anyone anywhere. You don't, it's, they're much cheaper. You don't have to train operatives. You don't have to um, run any kind of uh, chance of being uncovered. You know, there's no criminal prosecutions. Even if you're caught, as we've caught many Russian cyber actors operating from Russia in the past, those folks can be indicted here in the United States, but they'll never be returned here for prosecution. So it's low risk, incredibly high reward, either politically, because it enables you to do um, misinformation campaigns, influence campaigns, you know, also all the active measures campaigns we saw in uh, 2016 in the election. Um, so it's low risk, it's high reward, and it also is a pathway to economic reward. So similar to other nations, the, the Russian cyber actors are not just interfering in our politics. They're not just trying to sow division in our society with disinformation and misinformation. They're also very good at stealing information and research and development um, uh, technology for the benefit of Russia and the Russian military industrial alliance or Russian you know, technological firms. The, you know, the Russian economy is based on, as you know better than I do, based almost entirely on raw materials and, you know, efforts like mining and things like that. And that only goes so far. They're not as good at developing new technologies. They don't have kind of a Russian, you know, uh, uh, analog of our Silicon Valley, for instance. Uh, but they're quite good at invading other, you know, uh, foreign um, cyber networks and stealing that information. So it's, it's incredibly beneficial. It's low risk. They increase their capabilities to do it uh, every day. Uh, every, every operation, you know, they're learning and adapting and getting better and harder to detect. So I think that that's the, that's the high growth area right now for Russian intelligence and Russian private sector entities and and those sorts of things. That doesn't mean that they're gonna abandon any of the other approaches, the human collection approaches, the recruitment of spies, um, and of course, uh, the military buildup, which um, really looked uh, concerning towards the end of the Trump administration with you know, everybody turning back to the kind of procurement of nuclear weapons, the idea of, of rearming, turning around a process of disarmament that's been in underway for decades. Um, but with any luck, uh, we may be able to avoid that diplomatically. Right. right. Yes, with any luck and with great hope that um, we don't get into um, an escalation um, between two uh, nuclear powers. Um, in terms of thinking about how the US might um, need to reconfigure or pivot to face this threat, um, we know that the Russian state, like the Soviet state before it, included a service specifically devoted to the conduct of what are called active measures in the Russian context, right? And these are measures that are intended not simply to collect intelligence or influence uh, a particular polity, but actually intended to produce a particular political outcome. 
Um, furthermore, the Russian state partners with uh, hacker organizations and other right um, quasi non-state uh, groups in order to achieve its ends. And the United States doesn't do this in this way. Um, so my question is, what are the implications of organizational asymmetry in intelligence for the US government's capacity to monitor and intervene in current Russian active measures? Um, what's the role of the FBI here? And could you comment on current and past interagency cooperation in this area? Sure. So um, I guess the institutional asymmetry, it's an interesting idea. I'm not sure that that perfect symmetry is actually necessary to repel those sorts of threats. Um, it's, uh, you know, it gets to, we, I, in my class last week, we had a, a pretty, uh, um, pretty energized discussion about around the concept of, um, you know, talking about the, the, our debates in this country after 9-11 around the use of enhanced interrogation techniques and torture and things like that. And, and, you know, some people still approach those issues from the perspective of like, well, if the other guy is doing it, we have to do it too, or else they'll just keep doing it and, and we're at some sort of a disadvantage. Um, I don't, I certainly don't agree with that in the context of, uh, of enhanced interrogations, but I'm not sure that the, I, I think I, I don't agree with that, that requirement of symmetry in, in your question either. I think that um, what it requires from the United States government is a more robust, more active kind of proactive cyber defense capacity and one that spans seamlessly from government to the private sector. I mean, 99% of our cyber infrastructure in this country is, is owned, run, operated, and protected by the private sector. And uh, we've never really been um, very agile in our interactions with the private sector around cybersecurity issues. I think it's gotten slowly better over time, but we have a long way to go. On the interagency side, um, there's no what you cannot. There, there's no single government entity that really could handle the whole cybersecurity. How do we defend against Russia and other countries? Frankly, um, it's got to be a whole of government approach. I think we lost a bit of that coordination um, in the last four years when, with the elimination of kind of the the White House's cyber czar position. Um, there was a uh, congressional, kind of a bipartisan congressional effort uh, a few years ago to bring that back. So it's not a controversial thing. I think there's no question we need that sort of whole of government um, approach on the cyber side. From the FBI's perspective, I mean, the FBI is really, um, the FBI does two things. And I'll try to be very careful in how I answer this question so as not to get in any more trouble. Um, but the FBI obviously is the primary organization that lead, if you will, in investigating acts of, of you know, malign cyber activity. So when we find out that a corporation or a government entity has been hacked, you know, it's really up to the FBI to figure out who did it and where did the stuff go, whether it's money or data or what that might be, and can we hold those folks responsible in one way or another. In addition to that, the FBI um, participates in um, through the use of uh, through the use of court authorized um, surveillance uh, participates in some of the surveillance activity that enables the government to see and understand what uh, malign cyber actors are doing out there in cyberspace. So, so, so Bureau really does have a big role. Um, but there are many other responsibilities that need to be covered. Uh, it's been great to see DHS really step up to the plate in the last couple of years. I think the expansion of CISA and Chris Krebs, who was the head of that organization within DHS, I thought did a phenomenal job, particularly with their focus on election security. Um, of course, speaking the truth about it ultimately cost Mr. Krebs' job, which shouldn't surprise any of us, but uh, it's, ultimately a sad, sad thing to watch happen. Um, but there is a huge role for DHS here in terms of protecting the infrastructure, coordinating with the, with the private sector, and really being, um, being maybe more proactive in the way they watch attacks coming into the private sector. I think that's one of the big vulnerabilities that SolarWinds exposed to us. How did we not see this coming? How did 
all of the defenses we have in place really failed uh, on this one. And um, I would expect there's a lot of hard thinking going on right now to figure out how to reposition. Thank you. Okay, that's really helpful to understand. We, I have one last question, then we're going to um, go to questions from the audience. Um, this last question has to do with um, the flip side of the domestic security th threats associated with the former president, um, and this has to do with international security threats associated with the former president, um, potentially. I wonder if you could um, speak to expectations here. We know that there are many um, that former presidents have access to a great deal of um, uh, classified information, and um, and in this particular instance, uh, Everybody is sort of waiting to see what happens. Um, there is also the question of um, the previous administration's treatment of presidential records acts or the act, right, in which uh, the previous president's meetings with uh, Vladimir Putin, for example, uh, were not, um, there are few records we know of uh, on the American side, but uh, there are almost certainly records on the Russian side. Someone has them. So what do you expect to come out of all of this? Um, and uh, how do you expect it to be handled? I expect more chaos and confusion. It seems to be the, our direction over the last couple of years. Now, I, I um, well, well, let me start first with the the question of uh, former president's access to classified. So, classified information is, is very simple. You don't get access to it if you don't have a need to know, and that same standard is applied to everybody. Um, Typically, former presidents it would, uh, have been considered to have had a need to know because the current president uh, might want to reach out to that former president and discuss issues with them to get their counsel or advice or perspectives on any number of things. And, and most, most presidents have done that with former presidents. Uh, I think in this case, it's pretty clear that uh, I think it's probably a 0% chance that President Biden would reach out to President Trump for his perspective on, on these issues. So I, I think fundamentally he will, won't have the need to know. Now, I don't know if he'll ask for access to anything. He might not even ask, but I think it's, uh, it's hard to imagine that the administration would go out of their way to get him access to classified. I mean, let's face it, he didn't spend a lot of time reading classified information while he was president. So it'd be hard to, um, explain why he needed access to that. Now, my concern if he did have access, it's certainly not my decision that would be up to President Biden, but I think that uh, A, President Trump has a known um, um, history of, of handling classified information improperly. He revealed uh, highly classified information from a foreign service to the Russians in the Oval Office. He shared classified um, U.S. Uh, government uh, imagery, signals, uh, um, satellite imagery on his Twitter feed. So like we know that he doesn't really understand or have much respect for classified information. And second, we also know that he has a tendency to, to monetize everything that comes across his desk. And so I wouldn't even, I don't even want to think about how that could happen. Um, in terms of his, the concerns about the Presidential Records Act, um, I think it's, it's, it's deeply concerning that um, it's likely we won't know for a while because I don't think the Biden administration really um, would probably want to make an issue of this right now. But I wonder what sort of records about decisions and decision making processes were actually retained. Um, as you said, you pointed out, we know that this president did the opposite of of that, right? He um, he actively sought out not creating records, making sure that note takers were not in the room when he was having conversations with foreign leaders, making sure that the normal um, staff who would listen in on those sorts of calls would not be on those calls. So they couldn't be witnesses to what he said or did or agreed, did or did not agree to. So I think probably a lot was lost there, um, which is does not put the put the current administration in very good hands. Um, I'm quite sure all those governments were probably recording, making detailed recordings and notes about those interactions. And, and now they know about them better than we do, which is never a good thing. All right, thank you. We're gonna to go to questions from the audience now, um, of which there are many. So we won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll do our best to, uh, to address a selection here. 
Um, so one question here has to do with um, investigations and threat identification uh, and the non-political and uh, independent nature of um, those ideally uh, with respect to party politics. The question is, does the US have a problem with the politicization of FBI investigations? No, no, the, you, you don't. Um, Listen, FBI people have political beliefs, just like all Americans do, right? And in fact, you don't want to hire people who have no knowledge of or understanding of politics. I mean, that would be, you'd be hiring people who are particularly uninformed and, you know, not, not really plugged in. So FBI people certainly have their own uh, political preferences. But I can tell you that in the course of my work as a street agent in New York City, all the way up to being acting director, um, I did not see, contrary to what you've heard from many people on the Hill and our former president and the news media that supports him, I never saw um, people making decisions, taking actions, opening cases or closing cases based on their politics. I think it was really unfortunate that so many people within the FBI um, you know, voice their frustration over the decisions in the Hillary Clinton email case, because that certainly exposed an underlying frustration that was based on political bias. And that was, I think, quite destructive to the organization. But fundamentally, I saw thousands and thousands and thousands of cases open, closed, worked uh, to, one, to one end or another. And I cannot tell you that I saw cases being pursued by FBI agents because of their political beliefs. Just didn't happen. OK, thank you very much. Yep. Um, all right. so. Um... Um, so the next question we have um, it sort of relates to, a, a, it's, a, it's a related question, and it has to do with the divergent um, treatment of um, participants in the January 6th attack um, and uh, treatment of um, social justice and particularly the movement for Black, Black Lives protesters um, in recent months. W what do you have to say about that? Um, I, I guess I should start just by saying that um, the idea of that and the apparent, um, you know, what from what I saw watching, from what I saw on the streets in uh, last summer during several of those uh, Black Lives Matter protests, um, to what I saw watching on television on January 6th, that's a, that's a disparity that I cannot explain um, from my perspective as a private citizen. But I do think that that needs to be part of a serious inquiry um, around the events of January 6th. And I, the way that I think about it is, I believe that it might, I don't know this for a fact, but it's possible that that disparity exposes a difference in the way that people at the FBI and other agencies were thinking about the threat intelligence leading up to January 6th. Um, they, whatever intelligence they had around the Black Lives Matter protest caused them to take that intelligence very seriously. And there was a significant, you know, call out of the National Guard and closures of streets and businesses and things like that. And, and we all saw what happened at Lafayette Square. Um, and then you compare that to January 6th and those decisions, those, those um, and that analysis of the intelligence and the assessments that come from that analysis were clearly very different. And I think to me, that's one of the most significant issues around January 6th is how we think about that threat and what intelligence we had and what decisions we made based on that intelligence exposes how we think about it. If we went into January 6th, just assuming that a crowd of, you know, red hat wearing Trump supporters did not pose a threat, um, why did we think of it that way? Did we think of it that way because of their political beliefs or because of the history that we've seen with those folks over the course of rallies and other protests in the last few months? Or, you know, or were there other reasons? Did we bring implicit biases into that analysis that this group could not be or would not be violent or confrontational? Whereas what sort of biases did we bring to our analysis and assessment of the protest activity last summer? So I think that's a really important question 
Uh, we're not going to answer it in any way other than by really sitting down and looking to the intelligence, looking at the information we had before each of those events, talking to the people that worked them, asking them questions that are not designed to put them in personal jeopardy or fire anybody, but just to figure out like, how do we think differently? Um, how do we maybe make decisions more consistently and more fairly? And also how do we think differently about this, um, this domestic violent extremist, this right-wing threat that we're looking at right now. Thank you. So we have a, a number of questions about Afghanistan. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read out one of them, and maybe you could just elaborate. Um, sure. So our first question was, can our current troop force in Afghanistan keep al-Qaeda from reestablishing a base there? I doubt it. Uh, I'm not a military expert, but we are down to a very small footprint in Afghanistan. And um, it's, a, it's an incredibly challenging situation because the Taliban has been on the rise. They have been um, building and support. They've been more aggressive in operations and, and particularly targeting civilians right now. In the meantime, um, they've also taken a lot of territory back. They now have recaptured territory that they didn't have you know, that they haven't uh, occupied since the late 90s or, or 2000, 2001. Um, at the same time, the, the elected government is really collapsing and the popular perception of the elected government is incredibly negative. Many people in Afghanistan actually, although they maybe don't agree with the Taliban on philosophical levels and they, they certainly, nobody likes the violence, Taliban's actually able to kind of deliver some services to people in terms of protection and dispute resolution and things like that. So you have the, the Taliban's really on the rise, the elected government is really collapsing. And in the middle, you have the US government. We've always been on the side of the elected government. We're trying to establish some sort of a constitutional democracy there. Um, that seems to be falling further and further out of reach. Uh, so it's, it's really a very binary choice for the administration. Do they, stick with the agreement on May 1st and pull out everyone and allow the place to just kind of implode on itself, which would likely result in Taliban rule and the return to these incredible acts of atrocities and mistreatment of women and everything that Taliban is well known for? Or do you go all in? Do you bring back the troop levels um, to a point that's actually effective in um, kind of propping up the government, but also counteracting the violence, much of, what is, which, much of, of which is coming from the Taliban right now. Uh, so it's really like a, it's an all or nothing sort of approach, which um, that's a tough call to make. Indeed. Um, all right, we have a, another question which has to do with um, both uh, international politics and domestic politics uh, at its source. What will the Biden administration do about the prevalence of military level weapons among the population, that this means the American population at large and in police departments? That'll be really interesting to see. Um, I don't think um, President Biden, I don't, at least from my own recollection of the campaign, I don't think he made kind of second amendment um, sort of issues a, you know, a, a principal part of this campaign and, and probably for very understandable political reasons, it's incredibly um, volatile kind of divisive, divisive thing. So in his effort to kind of maintain that middle ground, be the moderate guy, maybe, maybe he decided to kind of stay away from that. Um, <clears throat> I would hope that the administration looked towards the sort of um, reforms to our gun laws in this country that are absolutely needed, many of which were talked about and, and the Obama administration talked about and tried to enact but couldn't, couldn't uh, deliver on ultimately legislatively. Um, and quite frankly, are supported by like 90% of Americans. Um, there is a very vocal kind of pro Second Amendment anti gun control, uh, you know, group in this country. But there's a much bigger, you know, uh, the, the part of the curve, of people who think like, yeah, it's probably not a good idea that kids should be able to buy guns or our, the, 
I could go for hours on this. I won't, I promise. But the process that we have in this country to, to, to conduct background checks for firearms purchases is just, um, it's like razor thin. It's bar barely holding up under the burden of the number of gun transactions that takes place in this country every, every day. And it's really uh, inconsistent because it's not, you know, all the FBI does many of them, but not all of them because states don't have to go through the same process. So we really need to shake down that system and come up with some sort of a more um, consistent approach to how we regulate gun sales and gun purchases. So that's my hope in the way that they, you know, in one of the, um, you know, for the new administration's agenda, but we're going to, we're going to have to wait and see, I'm afraid on that one. Okay, um, so we have a question uh, that is related to that, but at a higher level of um, government. And this person asks, if the president, if a president of the United States has the highest security clearance, why is there no security background check before they run for office? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so the president of the United States doesn't actually have, a, he doesn't have to have a security clearance. And I think that's, um, that reflects the fact that the president needs to be the person chosen by the American people. And it's, it would be kind of fundamentally um, anti-democratic if the American people, uh, the majority of them anyway, could decide to uh, elect a president and then some, you know, some part of the government or an intelligence agency or whatever could say, well, no, you can't have access to classified information and therefore can't really do the job of president, can't have access to the information that you need to make decisions about national security and other, and, and other things. So it's an interesting, you know, I certainly understand and support the kind of constitutional dem democratic elements of that, but it does raise it as a kind of a weird issue. So as any random person who wants to work for the federal government in a classified capacity, uh, you have to undergo a pretty, um, a, an incredibly rigorous process to get a uh, to get a top secret clearance. But as the as the man in charge who ultimately gets to make the decisions about who who we go to war with and how we make peace with the other with the other folks, um, yeah, you don't you don't have you don't have to go through that at all. Okay, so I think we have question. We have time for one short um, question, although this is not a short answer, probably. But um, we have a few questions that relate to the relationship between civil rights and surveillance. Um, Patriot Act Two. Um, so the question is: In new legislation, you suggested um, to require to combat domestic terrorism. How would you uh, adjudicate between the need to protect individual civil rights and the need for surveillance in a world that is different from the Patriot Act, right? Now, private yeah. companies have lots of information. Yeah, very, very different situation here from the Patriot Act and the way that we approach uh, international terrorism. So in, without getting too crazy detailed, um, you know, international terrorism is different because it is a federal crime to be a member of a foreign terrorist organization. So simply being a member, providing support, what have you, is a, is a federal crime. And um, the foreign nature of international terrorism makes surveillance, the idea of surveillance, an entirely different thing. In the, within the United States, um, so on the domestic violent extremist side, the only way that you can conduct uh, surveillance, uh, electronic surveillance of those groups is through the same way that you do in a criminal case. At the federal level, it's called a Title III warrant. So you go to a, a local uh, federal judge and you have to prove to, you know, you have to show the judge that uh, you have reason to believe that uh, the people and the facilities they're using to communicate are involved in the commission of some sort of crime. So that's the basic difference. And it greatly, because any surveillance that you do under Title III is ultimately revealed in court, that greatly limits the sort of technology that you can use. You can't use any kind of classified um, techniques or technology because all that stuff would be you know, exposed to the public in court. So it's, it's limited in that respect. I don't think we should change that really in our thinking about new legislation for domestic terrorism. Um, I, don't, I can't imagine a legislative regime in which we could start designating groups 
domestic terrorist organizations in the same way that we do for foreign groups. Because as I said, um, each one of these groups, no matter how abhorrent you think their beliefs are, they're entitled to their beliefs. They're entitled to pursue their political you know, theories through, through peaceful means in, in the same way that everyone else here is. So that protection of political speech, you really cannot and should not step on. Um, however, um, those folks who engage in criminal activity in pursuit of an ideology, uh, right now, you can only convict them and punish them for that underlying criminal activity. I think it's fair to say that if you commit a violent crime in pursuit of an ideology for the purpose of coercing or intimidating the population or affecting the outcome of government, which that's the definition of domestic terrorism, that in itself should be an offense, that you have committed an offense of domestic terrorism. And simply by making an offense and convicting people of it and punishing them for it, you are legitimizing and acknowledging the seriousness of that activity. And I think that could, um, you know, that might help uh, convince some people not to engage in that. All right, we will have to leave it there, um, although it would be great to be able to pursue this conversation further on that and other points. Um, thank you so much, Director McCabe, for your participation today um, in this dialogue and uh, to all who submitted questions and um, and again to Professor Mack for having organized this. So um, thank you so much, Professor Pisano and Professor Mack, and thank you, New School uh, community. It's always a pleasure to, to, to be able to interact with you. These are great conversations, and um, I wish you the best going forward.